Thanks for joining our webinar today. As a reminder, we're, uh, we'll be recording this and invite you to make any comments or questions in the Q&A box or the chat, and we'll get to those either during the webinar or immediately after. We'll also be providing a kind of a one-page write-up that will be posted at cap.unl.edu. That's cap.unl.edu, just summarizing what we've gone over today. I'm Dr. Elliot Dennis, a professor uh, with the Center for Agricultural Profitability here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. We do these uh, webinars on a weekly basis on Thursday at noon central, and you can find an archive of all of our past webinars and, and a schedule of upcoming webinars also at cap.unl.edu. Well, recently the uh, 2023 U.S. cattle inventory was released on Tuesday, um, and today we're going to be reviewing those numbers discuss what that means for herd liquidation and up all along the supply chain all the way to uh, the feedlot producer. Uh, and we're gonna talk specifically about what are some of the factors that will potentially continue to potentially drive liquidation and what, what can be some reasonable price expectations going into 2023. So with that, I'll go and begin. And as a reminder, if you do have questions, uh, for me, feel free to put them in the Q&A box or in the chat, and we'll get to them as soon as we can. So as a reminder, all of this information that I'll be sharing to you is public. Uh, USDA does a great job of archiving all this information. If you're not familiar with where this information is, uh, the full report uh, will be is a link here. This will take you to this page here on the right, which is uh, kind of the archive for all USDA reports. It will have a PDF, a text file um, that you'll be able to access there. If you don't want to go to that link, USDA NAS does post it there where you can also uh, fill out your cattle inventory survey or even your census of ag survey. So if even if you get a request and you lose it, you can also go there and fill it out. And as a reminder that uh, about you know a little over a year ago, the USDA started live streaming their policy briefing. And so anytime there's a major report that comes out, you'll actually be able to go and, and see the live stream from the, uh, the WASD headquarters or the cattle inventory report. So if you want to, for future events, these are all live streamed as well. Um, so let's just talk about how they, actually get this cattle inventory report. I think it's good to provide some perspective on that. From about December 31st, 2022 to January 18th, the USDA Na uh, National Agriculture Statistics Service interviewed almost 36,000 people uh, throughout the United States. They use a stratified sampling. And so what that means is they try to look at uh, operation size within states and that state's representative share throughout the United States. And so we look here in Nebraska where we're at or even surrounding states, uh, quite a few number, almost 1700 uh, operations are sampled within Nebraska. So if you are participating and you completed that, thank you very much for doing that. The USDA is able to report these numbers for everyone because of people like yourself. Um, so this is very representative and you think about, you know, contacting 3,600 producers over, you know, basically two, two and a half weeks. It's a monumental effort that USDA undertakes. So appreciate their efforts for that. So what did we end up seeing? Uh, overall, we did see a, a large herd liquidation. The USDA and the cattle inventory reports, uh, beef cows and also milk cows and so we need to separate those and so on the right hand side this all cattle and calves that consists of both uh, beef cows and dairy cows and then we look at specifically on the beef cows and milk cows milk cows were basically break even they were had a little bit of a gain so all the liquidation that happened in uh, in the cattle inventory report is really attributed to the reduction in the beef cow herd and then USDA breaks it down on the type of uh, cattle that's being produced, separated steers, heifers, bulls. And really what we're trying to look at here is trying to figure out where are we at as far as beef cow numbers and 
if we're in a rebuilding phase or in a contractionary phase. So generally when we see continue to have beef cow heifers for beef cow replacements, that's lower, essentially means that producers are not yet retaining heifers to start rebuilding their herds. So that means we're continuing a liquidation phase. And then we look at the expected to calve number, which was about down about 5% is of the heifers that are retained, what, are, what calves or what of heifers are expected to be calving this year. And so that gives us an idea of, well, we know we can retain heifers, it, you know, depending upon their age and where we're at in the breeding cycle, we can actually, those heifers will be calving out to affect this year's feeder calf inventory, or it could be in the 2024 feeder calf inventory. So that ratio gives us an idea of how much of those heifers that are retained are actually gonna be calving this year. And then of course we have the cattle on feed. And as we'll go into this, this cattle on feed number that USDA reports is different than the cattle on feed number that's reported in the monthly cattle on feed report. Namely, it includes feed lots that are less than uh, with a thousand head capacity. So really when we talk about the cattle inventory report, what we're thinking about is uh, price movements that happen either pre or post the inventory report. There's a lot of work that's been done on market movements and trade expectations. And so anytime we're thinking about what does the report say, we really need to compare it to what did the market think the report was going to do and what did the report actually say. And that's what this figure on the left hand side uh, represents. This gray bar represents the trade average which is a four to six national analysts uh, publicly submit their reports. And that, that gray bar just represents the range of those estimates. And so uh, we can see where there was much more agreeance or uh, disagreeance amongst the analysts. The black uh, dot represents the trade average. So of those analysts that were surveyed that provided a result, what was the average uh, estimate for a particular category. And then the red dot represents what NAS actually reported. And so when we see that like the all cattle and calves, that uh, red dot and black dot are on top of each other, that would indicate that there, the market was correctly predicted what NAS was going to come out with. And so we should see no impact on the total cattle inventory. Now, each one of these has a, a different result. So let's, let's look at beef cows. There was a lot of discussion that was going on about total cow, cow slaughter that was happening throughout the year. And a lot of people were kind of anticipating that four, four and a half percent reduction in, in total cows and heifers. That's where that people were pretty in agreement with that, but then NAS came out and said, actually people were liquidating, but they weren't liquidating as much as we thought they were gonna be. And so there you can go through these estimates as well. But it's important also that as we work through a cattle cycle, US, uh, USDA and trade estimates tend to follow a particular pattern. I found this pretty interesting is that this, once again, the gray bar represents the trade average. The blue line represents the first estimate. And then uh, the red line represents the uh, final estimate. And so the example is the 2022 cattle inventory report came out last year. That was the first estimate. USDA, when they're making the 2023, goes back and sometimes modifies the 2022 cattle inventory report. Generally, those estimates or, and revisions are less than one half of 1%, so pretty small. And that's what the differences between those lines would represent. But if we know that when we're building, like we were in 2014, the trade average tended to say that we weren't going to be, uh, we are basically under predicting what USDA was actually doing. And then as we started to contract a bit more, we've actually believed that we were gonna contract faster. So um, when we hear kind of that market commentary about, oh, pretend, perhaps we're, uh, we're liquidating a bit faster, that, that provides some evidence to that. 
So let's go through each one of these categories. Let's talk about what this looks like over time, how to put these uh, reduction into perspective, and then also uh, talk about what are some of the drivers that went behind that number. So when we look at, like I said, the total cows, uh, which is a composition of beef cows and milk cows, we were down about three and a half percent on the beef cows and basically null on the, on the milk cows. When we look at where we are at on this left-hand side, this left graph, we were, are basically at the total number of beef cows that we were at in that 2014. So when we think about putting this total number of cows that we have into perspective, we are basically there where we were at. So the question that's being kicked around a lot now is, are producers going into 2023, are we gonna start that rebuilding phase or not? or are we gonna to continue to liquidate? So let's talk about kind of where that happened. So NAS provides a national estimate, but then within the report, they also provide state level impacts. So we can look at what was happening in Nebraska versus what was happening in, in uh, California, for, for example. So when we talk about beef cow inventory, it's important to look at the percentage and the actual nominal value. And so uh, the example would be that, uh, you know, Vermont or Maine might be up, you know, 10%, but they only have, you know, you know 10,000 head. So it's not as meaningful as a 5% increase in, in Nebraska. So Texas still is, you know, the, the big leader in, in beef cow inventory. And so when we're talking about uh, drought implications, we're talking about uh, weather impacts, that tends to be why we tend to focus there and in the Southern Plains as kind of a barometer. Here in Nebraska, uh, we're at, you know, about 1.7 and we are down basically about 1%. So pretty much even, we did decline a little bit, but we were about even. Colorado saw some gains, Missouri saw some gains, and Iowa and South Dakota um, were probably our biggest uh, kind of surprises particularly South Dakota, when they had such large liquidation that happened this year. So as I mentioned, drought was one of the primary factors that was really driving this. Uh, USDA provides this report that I, I, I really like. I think they do a good job on this. And the left-hand side shows where we were at prior to the 2022 inventory report. And uh, graph on the right shows where we're at prior to this uh, this year's inventory report. This uh, dashed yellow line indicates where we were in the severe drought, and the red kind of uh, dashed line represents where we're in moderate drought. When we overlay that drought map, which the University of Nebraska provides, with where we're at with cattle inventory, that's the darker uh, green and light green, we can actually see that why we were having such massive herd liquidation this year. Look at this on this right-hand side, right along this Great Plains, Northern Plains, Southern Plains, that's where drought, we were in the severest and moderate levels of drought. Um, and so about, you know, large portion of, of the cows that were on pasture were in that, uh, were in that area. Well, as I'm sure all of you know that, you know, as pastures started to deplete, we started to kind of work into our, our hay inventory, we actually saw a seismic drop in our total, uh, our total hay. So what we know is that as that kind of the hay supplies kind of goes down, if demand stays strong, well, prices should rise. Um, and so really we have two options there. We can continue to pay the higher price or we can liquidate part of our herd in order to match our current feed resources. So on the left-hand side shows you just how large of a drop it, where we're at in stocks relative to, you know, almost a 30 year average. So this is where we're at in 2022, about, um, you know, about 70, uh, 71, 72 million tons of hay in stock. And pretty significant decrease over time. 
and one of our largest one-time decreases in, uh, in the use of hay stocks that we've experienced in the last 20 years. One of the largest uh, relative to what we experienced in 2011, 2012. But once again, this is that's a national number. We can break down on where this hay prices is would have been likely pressured the most. And so as we start to see kind of the hay prices increasing or hay stocks increasing, that you know relieves some of that pressure. So that pressure would have been relieved somewhat in South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota. But for us here in Nebraska, um, we started to really eat into our hay stocks. Um, and that's why we're seeing really high prices on, on the hay, especially in our hay inventory reports. So the, the table down here at the bottom kind of shows you what's the seasonal variation in, and this is specifically for alfalfa hay and really how it's increased over time. Uh, in the 2022-2023 uh, production year in May 2022, we were averaging about uh, $244 a ton and continued to rise as it worsened throughout the year. And really this is some of the highest hay prices we've really seen in the last 30 years, even after controlling for inflation. So another factor is, you know, if we don't have the cows or maybe we have cows that are a little bit older uh, and we see market prices for cutter cows or slaughter cows or, or canner cows that are uh, reasonably high and we've maybe not experienced, you know, abilities to make profits, you know, it's, it's time to potentially recycling to cycle through our herd. And so that was what we also saw in through 2021 and really into 2022 was that this, uh, the demand for slaughter cows and, and cutter cows was, was quite large. So on the top right-hand side, that's where we can kind of see what was the dressed price uh, and the cutout price and what was the, uh, the basically farm gate price. The green line is the margin that you know, packers were experiencing on those. And so as that margin starts to go up, packers want to start buying more of those and it eventually puts downward pressure on price and we've kind of normalized to where we're at in 2017, 2018. Uh, when we look at where we're at on, on the cutter cows, pretty substantial increase all the way through the summer and the prices. And so once again, if we have opportunities to make profit, we have old cows that we're, we were thinking of getting rid of um, already, that just kind of feeds the, the herd liquidation. But kind of when we think through the whole supply chain, say, well, why were packers willing to pay so much for uh, these, these cows? You know, cutter cows are 90% lean. And so most of that product, most of that value is going into lean or ground beef. And it really starts with consumers. The US consumes so much ground beef in fact, most of our imports that come in are in the form of ground beef. And it's because we just have a strong desire to eat hamburgers and, uh, and use a lot of ground beef for a lot of meals. And so uh, that was driving a lot of those, uh, that demand as well, just our demand for uh, ground beef. So let's then rotate, say, okay, that's the beef cow side. That's gonna produce a feeder calf crop this year, but we also have heifers that have calved that are expected to calve this year, and also heifers that are gonna be brought in and expected to calve really in 2024. So where we were at, we were pretty much down in every category, beef cow replacements down about five and a half, almost 6%, uh, pretty, pretty significant decrease there. We are not quite at the levels that we were at in 2014. This kind of gives the first indication that among some analysts that we believe that there is a potential con to continue to liquidate at least partially in the first part of the year to uh, uh, within 2023. And although I said we had uh, you know static price or static inventory for meat milk cow replacements or milk cows in general, 
they were retaining less, which would suggest that in 2024 that we're going to have a little bit lower uh, herd size for milking um, and a potentially some impacts on the residuals such as milk and cheese and butter. So what is really what was driving you know the but some of the factors that were driving a producer decision to to retain heifers. Uh, what we see in some of the work that I've done is really showing that this we can look at what we call a lagging indicator or the number of heifers that are on feed as a percent of the total cattle on feed. And as that number starts to grow up, go up, that would indicate that we're continuing to contract. And as that number starts to go down, that means we're starting to begin expansion here. And so when we look at this, what this looks like over the last three cattle cycles, uh, that's what this figure on the top left is. The per or the red line represents that 91 to 2004 cattle inventory or cattle cycle. The green line represents the uh, 2005 to 2014. And that purple line represents the current cattle cycle we're in. So if you notice, we're pretty much peaking out where we were at in the uh, the last cycle in the 1991 to 2004. And so do we think we're going to continue to retain? Most of us believe that we're probably heifers as a percent of total cattle on feed is likely to remain high at least through the first half of the year, which would suggest that we're going to continue to pass through heifers into the feed. Another one of those, those driving factors is that um, the total steer to heifer price spread provides incentives or disincentives to actually put cattle on feed, right? And so we, we know that when that widens or contracts, that's going to have a different impact upon our decision whether we want to place the, or sell those or retain them. And so both of those factors were, uh, were working against retaining heifers. The, uh, what I've started to notice as far as total national cattle inventory uh, is that we actually see some of that pressure coming off and that uh, steer heifer price spread starting to narrow. The other issue that, that uh, can really put a damper on herd expansion, particularly this year, is the availability of land. So if we're wanting to expand, uh, we really have two options if we want to expand beyond our fixed base of uh, total acres that we're, we're using. We can either rent or we can, um, or we can buy. And the figure on the left is something I've worked with Jim Jansen. He runs the Nebraska Farm Real Estate Report that's through the Center of Agriculture Profitability. If you're not familiar with it and you want to see where some of this data comes from, it's available also at cap.unl.edu forward slash real estate. And you can get all the historical uh, and most recent real estate reports. But within that, he reports or collects and, and reports what are the uh, feeder cattle, uh, basically cow calf pair uh, rental rates by region within Nebraska through the last you know, uh, 40 years. And what we see actually is that as that interest rate, you know, the ability or the cost that it, it requires us to take out a loan against the bank on feeder cattle and the land values, they're pretty much inverse related. So as uh, it's cheaper to own something, you don't have to pay as much interest, then that tends to it tends to rise both tillable and non-tillable grazing land. And so as we've talked about some of the economy and, and what the Fed's gonna do, uh, the Dallas uh, Federal Reserve releases a feeder cattle specific interest rate. And that's what shows here on, on the bottom right-hand side. So really up until about uh, the third quarter of last year, it was pretty, uh, pretty static. Uh, no real change in the last uh, about 10 years, 10 to 15 years. But uh, the most recent increase shows that there is going to be potential constraints on the purchase of, of or that interest rate is going to be more expensive 
constraining some of that cost. It's the most recent estimate is about it's about eight percent. And so, uh, can we rent the land? First off, is it is it reasonable to expect that you know that we can actually take out that that land rental rate at you know non our grazing land tillable at you know fourteen hundred dollars an acre, um, or about it's about I think sixty dollars on average per cow calf pair per month. So those are some some real constraints on the ability to, to cash flow some of this. And the last is there's this a lot of chatter about uh, what what's going to happen with weather, and weather is unpredictable, uh, but really in summary, kind of where that at is for the last two or three years, we've been in a pattern called La Nina. And essentially it just creates a warming pattern in the Southern Plains and in, into parts of the, into the Northern Plains. But uh, this year, they expect that uh, the El Nino pattern which will provide some cooler, wetter patterns through the Southern Plains and into parts of the Northern Plains will we'll kind of flip. It kind of rotates back and forth or they call it oscillating. And so that has the potential to relieve some of these, uh, you know, pasture and, and forage prices to provide some reduction in total input costs to, uh, to at least allow us to, to rebuild. <clears throat> but some of the patterns would suggest that even though the weather might be there, that people might not uh, rebuild. So on the left-hand side is when we look at percent of total slaughter that's heifers, it's about third, a little over 30% right now. And the all cows, that would be that would include um, dairy cows and beef cows, is about 20, 21%. And so when we uh, look at where we are at when we start to rebuild and we look at slaughter, we don't start to see herd rebuilding really before we drop, uh, before we drop below uh, 30, 30 or 29 to 30% of heifer slaughter. And when uh, total cow slaughter is about 18, 19%. So cow slaughter would ha it has to come down and heifer slaughter has to come down in order to indicate that we're actually starting to rebuild. We call these lagging indicators because the cattle have already been killed and we, we know that for sure. But one of the ways that we can uh, track this before the animals actually get killed is with a leading indicator and that's the number of, of heifers that are sold that weigh over 600 pounds. And the USDA provides a number of all the cattle that are sold throughout the United States. And when we look at just the trend within that data, this is, uh, that's the bottom left-hand side. And we're at about um, almost 41% of, of all the cattle being sold are, are heifers. But the real important is the direction on this and it's already starting to decrease. This provides some slight indication that perhaps uh, producers are starting to retain. So we should expect this to go down before we start to see slaughter. And what I'm what I'm seeing is that this is already starting to come down. The last is if we continue to see pretty high prices and some of those feed costs uh, go down, so the margin per for weaned exposed weight, or if we want to do uh, profit margin, uh, as that starts to widen, there will be greater incentive to, to retain. Where we're at in Nebraska on five, six weights, about uh, the USDA AMS reported about 225 for five, six weights, 100 or per pound um, this, past, uh, this past week. So relative, much higher than our, certainly our five year average, higher than 2022, and pretty close to where we're at in the 2013, 2014. So let's talk about what the calf crop would look like this year. And then what is that calf crop potentially gonna do 
once we get to the feed yard. So on the left-hand side, this was our calf crop. USDA reports two numbers. They report a what happened the first half of the year. So this would be our spring calving herd. And then what is our fall calving herd, depending upon where you're at. In the United States has different preferences for that. Still about, um, about two thirds of all of the um, cattle are, or about 70% of all the cattle are continue to be spring, uh, spring calving herds. And about one third is about the fall calving herd. We saw a greater reduction in the fall calving herd than the spring calving herd, uh, an overall reduction about 2% in calf crop. Once again, even though we have uh, continued to go down on our, uh, our beef cow numbers and also our, our heifer retention, uh, we don't, that will, number will likely come down to about you know, 23 and a half, uh, 24 or 30, sorry, 33 and a half to 34 million in the coming years. So we take all of those numbers and say, okay, some of those calves are at the ranch. Some of those calves have left the ranch, but not yet entered the feed lot. And so this kind of gives us, we can take all of these USDA numbers and calculate a feeder cattle supply. And this really represents the number of feeder cattle that are outside the feed yard, but not at the ranch. And even then we saw that kind of liquidation happen in there. So where are these feeder cattle that are outside feed yards? Uh, well, like I said, most of them are in Texas, but even here in Nebraska, we have a sizable amount. Our stalker industry is particularly growing um, but where we saw really the most impact is in the Oklahoma and Kansas region. Oklahoma has a lot of wheat pastures that they graze and didn't get enough moisture. And so a lot of those stocking densities went down. And so we had considerably the most, the largest reduction by far, um, in, within, uh, uh within Oklahoma. So where are we at, you know, and how is the market pricing in uh, this on the feeder cattle side? And so, as you know, the feeder cattle uh, CME specs is steers between 700 and 900 pounds. So these would be your yearlings. And so we can look at where the board is at, look at where historical basis is. We can combine those two and give and compare that to where prices are at. So uh, right now, on, let's say the March contract, is, I pulled this this morning, is at 185 or almost 186. In March, we go to the basis, it's about historically over the last you know, five, uh, yeah, last five years, uh, we average uh, a little over a, a plus two basis, which means cash, now, in our local market, tends to be two dollars higher than than what it actually is, and on CME when the contract expires. So, if we're trying to get an expectation of cash price or what we should expect in March, um, if we're trying to sell a 700 to 900 pound steer, we can add 186 plus two uh, for 188. Compare that to where we're at in the uh, the current. Uh, USDA report, and we'll see. And what we see is that actually the CME contract plus historical basis would suggest that we should actually be a little bit higher. It doesn't mean that the market's going to move higher, just shows that we're actually in a much weaker basis environment than we have been in the past. So, any of us that are in hedges will know that as basis weakens, this really impacts our, our profit. So eventually these cattle, steers, and some of these heifers are gonna eventually make it to the feed yard. So where, where are we at on the cattle inventory, or sorry, cattle on feed? And what we see is that when we look at it from a, uh, the breaking, breaking it down between the number of head that are over a thousand head 
uh, feed yards and those that are under. We're at about uh, 14,000 total cattle on feed uh, that are out there. And I, I point this out because this is something that when I talk to producers, it's overlooked a lot of the times. On the right hand side, I pulled the cattle on feed number from the monthly cattle on feed report. So every month, third, uh, third Friday, we, we get the cattle on feed. Look at this number, this green dot on the right hand side is about 11.6. That was the number reported by USDA all for the monthly cattle on feed report. That would, if we go to this table up here, that is exactly the 11.6 million cattle on feed but the cattle on feed report consists of about 85% of, you know, 80, 85% of all the cattle out there. So when we report, what is the other cattle on feed? These are your farmer feeders. It consists of a pretty sizable amount, almost 18% or 20% or one in every five cattle are not in these commercial yards. They're on farmer feeding operations. And so, that's the primary difference between uh, where we're at or what we observe in the cattle on feed report and what we actually observe in the cattle inventory report. And so these farmer feeders actually make up a considerable amount of the inventory. And these, these farmer feeders tend to be people who would sell in the negotiated, negotiated grid market. They tend to market once or twice a year. Uh, so pretty inconsistent much different than you know someone who's a commercial operation who who might be delivering cattle to a plant every week um, and so even though we're we're going down for cattle on feed uh, we still have had we still have a considerable amount of cattle out there so where you know where are we at as far as the total cattle on feed uh, here in nebraska we we're about even now this doesn't do it justice because we've really changed the type of cattle we feed here in Nebraska. Really back in 2008, we started, feedlot producers started making a, a pretty conscious choice to move away from lighter calves and really specialize in the in finishing yearlings. And some of that's been through the development of backgrounding yards. Um, but when we compare where we're at on cattle on feed, and the total cattle on feed in Texas, it's a little bit different. We're going to definitely, here in Nebraska, we produce a larger tonnage of, of the, the beef just because we're finishing at a, at a, at a heavier weight. But most of that reduction and um, cattle on feed came from the Southern Plains. And once again, as we take this in, market absorbs this information, where is the market currently reacting at? And we can look at where we're at on basis and, and get some price expectation. So uh, on the top hand side, this is the five market area, weighted area average, on average, live steer, 155, 100 weight, considerably higher than where we're at in the five, uh, five year average. We started to continue to trend upward during 2022. And the ex expectation is that we should at least be leveled the trending upward into 2023. But just because prices would suggest that it's going upwards, it doesn't necessarily mean the timing on which that beef will hit the market is going to be the same. And a lot of that has to do with that choice select spread incentivizing longer days on feed or fewer days on feed. Um, we were at a pretty high level, count, really counter cyclical than what we'd expect. And that's what this bottom left hand chart shows that we when we were in a period where we thought that choice select spread should be narrowing, it actually started to widen, which means it's a larger premium on choice cattle. But as we've entered into this year, we've started to see that kind of self correct itself, um, heading back to more where what we expect it to be in the five year and in the um, really in comparison to 2022. I anticipate this to continue to go down um, as we hit the um, April, May timeframe. 
but this is definitely going to shorten the days on feed. As we shorten the days on feed, we're shortening up both quality of production, but also total pounds. And that's what this is really showing here on, on the left-hand side. If we have fewer number of cattle or feeder cattle to push through, the incentive is always, well, we just increase carcass weights, right? But we know that heifers tend to finish at a little lighter uh, carcass weights. And that's definitely been the case this year. Uh, they are feeder or heifer carcass weights are, are definitely are significantly lower than even the five-year average. And so even though we're at pretty much where we're at in the five-year average for cattle dress weights, that's this bottom right-hand chart, uh, we see that dressed weights for steers, which is the left-hand side of this chart, is up. And so if I were to show you where heifers at, they're at that at 890, 895, they're below the five-year average. And so the anticipation is that as we start to narrow on that feeder cattle supply, given constant beef demand, uh, we're going to see those, we should expect to see some of those heifer or those uh, harvest weights go up. On the top hand side, this is what's giving me a little pause. A lot of this uh, we've talked about, you know, there's prices potentially increasing. Uh, forage practices and, and forage quality. And, but we're still seeing a significant amount of beef cow slaughter even into this year, which means suggests that people are still feeling the impacts of higher hay prices, uh, reduced conditions, reduced profit margins. Uh, this is surprising. I don't, I don't anticipate, especially if we start to can, uh, receive moisture, continue to receive moisture, I see this uh, really starting to, to come down more towards the five-year average uh, in really that early, early to late spring timeframe. And with that, uh, kind of gives you an idea of when I'm looking at where we're at in 2023, things that I'm keying off of, um, and how do we take this, you know, really this great information that USDA puts together in a monumental effort uh, and uh, try to make some uh, directions on kind of where we're going in the market. Um, do you, I'll, and with that, I'll take any questions that you have or clarification or, or comments, even that's what's happened on, on your operation. And just as a reminder, if, if you'd like to put those in, you can put those in the chat or, or the Q&A box and, and we'll get to them. Lot to, uh, lot to digest. Give it a few more seconds to. Okay, so Jesse Cecil said, what are your thoughts on <clears throat> where bread cow values will be in 2024? I think they're probably flat to more likely flat to increasing. Uh, the bread cow market tends to follow the, um, the cattle cycle pretty well in the sense that when we start to rebuild pretty aggressively and we start to retain, then we start to see those bread cow values kind of get bid up. If we're continuing to see um, kind of that the desire from producers to continue to liquidate and not the desire to, um, to retain heifers, I would expect some of those bread cow values to, um, to stay relatively flat. I can provide also a, a chart uh, in that one page report that shows kind of historically where we're at with those bread cow values as well. So uh, Kyle asks, what direction is the cow market trending? So I'll just go back to, oh, I'll go back to this. So
So on the right hand side, I would I'm expecting the the beef cow herd or beef cow slaughter to kind of continue to to be where it's at at elevated level into the 2020 uh, first part of 2023. If you remember spring, uh, late early to late spring, and so this is where we're at in the slaughter cow prices. This is the bottom right hand chart. Um, this would we're trending more towards that uh, five year average. I don't think that the reason why we're can we're going to continue to see uh, cow slaughter into 2023 is going to be due to prices, which is what I what I believe was driving really the 2021 and 2022 decisions. Mostly there was some drought, but as those pasture conditions improve, um, I think we're going to continue to maintain on that on that five year average. So if you look at this price to answer your question, is it trending? Well. It trends up a little bit into the summer as we, um, and that's mainly a supply supply driven issue. And as all the cows start to become open and we check them, they tend to fall off. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't anticipate a significant increase in that cold cow price. Randy said, so you don't think we have bottomed out in the cow herd? Um, I think if you go, I'll point you to this. I think we are, in my opinion, I think we've liquidated enough uh, to be where we need to be. Now producers, uh, and we look at this, especially historically, we're at where we were at in 2014, 2013, 2014. But I think we've liquidated enough. Prices have started to come up pretty significantly. I think we've definitely done enough um, to start rebuilding, especially if we get good spring weather, then yes, definitely we have the opportunity to, to rebuild this year, especially since prices are there. Uh, well, like I said, in, at the end of my presentation, what's puzzling is that the be we, even in the beginning part of this year, we've continued to have elevated beef cow slaughter. And so I personally think that We've done enough, but uh, the number of cows that are still going to town and being harvested would suggest that, that producers don't think we've liquidated enough. So, okay, so someone on Facebook said, uh, what, was, what was said for feeder prices, catching, catching up the inputs? So I'll go to uh, where we were at on, Uh, feeder cattle price. So seven, eight weights, we're at about 185 uh, in Nebraska and we tend to be pretty, cons pretty constant through about June. And then if we were to follow a similar price pattern of price magnitude, this is about, uh, this is about almost $20 a hundred weight uh, if we say that the similar price magnitude is going to happen consistent throughout the year, then at that peak at 190, 195 plus 20, that should would suggest that somewhere in the fall, that uh, seven eighths could be in the 215 range. Um, that would be for the seven eighths. And I think for the five, six weights, we were at about uh, 225 already, I believe can't can't find that but yeah we are up we are at about 225 i believe already in in the first part of this year so adam said is there any concern that profitability has has been a significant driver of liquidation rather than drought uh yes a absolutely the the we talk about these higher prices and and it's been great but on the on the flip side is while prices have been higher, our inputs have been higher as well, right? Distillers, the cake, the, the hay, the pasture. And so when we look at actually uh, what are the cow profit margins 
uh, per cow. Uh, you know, we would expect them to be a lot higher, but really they're in that $40, uh, $40 a cow range. And so, yeah, that's definitely those higher inputs have been shrinking some of that margin and has been, you know, in some case, like you're saying, Adam, maybe discourage some of that herd liquidation until a stronger margin can be obtained. Um, so, yeah, de definitely uh, that herd lick or it is being driven by, uh, by profitability, which would suggest that, you know, if we go into 2023 and uh, we start to get a good rain and we start to have, you know, quality pasture conditions. Uh, you know, last year we had terrible pasture uh, ratings. And uh, if we get good quality, good rains, get a good crop up of hay, that's going to release some of those higher input prices. Uh, corn is going to moderate you know, depending upon the analysts, somewhere in the five, you know, five to six dollar range. I think last time I saw it was maybe five sixty, and so that has the potential also to relieve some of those uh, the the feedlot side of a potentially, you know, buying being a bit more aggressive on the buy side of of feeder cattle as well. Uh, okay, any data. And then Adam also asked, uh, is there any data matching liquidation to producer age? I'm not aware of, of any of that data. Uh, I'd be happy to look at it if people know about it. The places where that would be readily available would be, or potentially you could look at that would be the Nebraska uh, Business Bureau, which is run out of, or is affiliated with our department and FinBin, um, if we're looking at stuff specific for Nebraska producers, but Kansas State uh, also provides a, a pretty comprehensive in their farm management survey. I could reach out to a few people if you're interested in, and see if they're noticing anything. Um, I would assume kind of that question is getting at uh, maybe potentially older producers are deciding to liquidate to get out um, rather than younger producers and even distribution is what I'm thinking you're getting at there. But So Mason said, do you have access to print this presentation? Yes, uh, the answer to that is yes. This uh, presentation will be available online at cap.unl.edu under the webinar recording. All of, all of this stuff will be provided and with my contact information. So if you download it or if you just have some clarification questions, always feel free to reach out. So Randy also asked, uh, we're seeing some producers run out of feed and, uh, and sell cows. Do you think these cows will be butchered instead of calved by someone else? Uh, I think that answer, uh, I, I don't know. I think it's obviously going to be dependent on the, the producer, but what the data would suggest right now or uh, Randy, is that it, it seems like those those cows are being harvested. They're not being calved out right now. Um, and so um, that that would uh, that would seem to say that you know people aren't buying those to try to rebreed them and and sell them back as bread cows. So Kyle said I'm at the bread cow and heifer market, not coals. Um, okay, sorry about that. So let me I think you were asking Ryan about what direction is the cow market. Okay, so what what is the direction of the heifer market? So let me go back here. So this is where I think that you know when we talk about the the you know the heifer market in general, what what we're seeing right now, this uh, blue line is like I said, we take out all of the variation that happens seasonally and we look at what is actually just happening to the trend. And what we see is that uh, about heifers are being discounted by about 10% of the steer price right now. But it's gone down from the peak of about 12%. And so what we're seeing is particularly in the heifer market is that, that prices relative to steers are starting to be more competitive, at least at the lighter weights. 
Now that's not necessarily true for the uh, for the heavier, uh, you know, stalker uh, stalker cattle. What we're seeing right there is that the discount for heifers relative to steers tends to be pretty constant. Um, as we, if we're thinking about those heifers going into the end of the feed yard, um, the, I think the real option there is, are those heifers gonna be competing out to go into the breeding herd? And I, I just don't think we know enough about uh, what that pasture condition is gonna to be like in order for those heifers to be retained. Uh, and I think I answered the bread cow market with, uh, with Jesse's, Jesse's question. And the last one from a Facebook user, where would you put a fat pricing historically to keep up with uh, two fifteen seven weights? Um, I don't, I don't have that right off the top of my head. I have the, I follow the, kind of what is the price ratio between the fat cattle to the um, to this to basically the five six weight uh, I can't uh, I should have looked at that before I, I can't remember and I, I would do an injustice to to say it but um, so I can get that and put it in that one page write up uh, that will be posted on on also at cap.unl under the under the webinar, but apologize for that. Uh, and then Adam will said, what are the data points and time ones that you'd recommend to look at um, to determine herd size throughout the year? Uh, Adam, if you're talking about total beef cow herds, you're talking about the individual producer uh, producer size. Um, when I'm looking at uh, basically beef cow herd from a national level, I'm looking at number one thing that I look at on a weekly basis um, is this beef cow slaughter number. I look at that number and then I look at total heifers that are sold through the, uh, all the different markets. That the direct, that's the direct auction, that's the video auction, um, that's the sale barn. And so I'm using those as kind of my uh, kind of my boundaries. I look at the auction data to suggest, okay, if more heifers are going through, that would mean that there's still not producers wanting to retain those to rebuild. And I look at the back end then, right, of, you know, in, you know, six to eight months, those heifers that are sold are going to eventually be harvested. And so that kind of gives me that, that moving window that I tend to look at throughout the year. So at, at both of those, we start to see cow slaughter come down. We start to see number of heifers that are over 600 pounds uh, being sold through these different auctions and markets go down. And both of those are going down at the same time. That's a very strong indicator that we are continue, we're gonna, we're in the rebuilding phase. So, so uh, I think we're, out of time, but I uh, appreciate all the questions. Once again, the, the webinar recording will be up there. Uh, we'll have the PowerPoint uh, here that you can download and, and use for whatever you'd like. Uh, I'm obviously available to chat after this or, and really anytime throughout the year as your questions. And then there'll be kind of a one page write up that you can reference as well. I'll try to summarize some of these questions and get to the questions that I didn't have the graphs for uh, and, and put comments in there. So with that, thank you everyone for coming. We remind you that uh, we have the weekly webinar every Thursday. Um, and if you could give us some feedback on the webinar, we're always trying to find topics that are interesting, uh, use some of our expertise, gather people. Um, if you're interested in kind of the cattle markets, uh, two uh, webinars that you might be interested, we're gonna be talking about kind of labor issues uh, that are in the cattle market. What are some of the immigration policies that will uh, that can potentially help? And then we'll also be having a webinar on kind of government policies uh, and kind of the government leading up to the farm bill and what are some of those? And we'll also be having uh, kind of what is, uh, what are the uh, 
conservation reserve program, conservation reserve program specifically for uh, for the uh, CRP grassland. And so this is kind of a new policy that kind of came out with CRP that you can start enrolling grassland into CRP. Those are specific for kind of the cattle industry. If you have um, interest in that, be on the watch for those and uh, we'll make sure to, to get you on there. Thank you again for coming. Adam, I think, uh, Ryan, if you could send out the link again. He said it's a, a dead link there for the, the evaluations. Thanks for letting us know about that, Adam. Um, appreciate uh, you kind of being here. If there's anything that we can do to help or just questions that you have, feel free to uh, feel free to get back to us. And once again, thanks for joining and have a great rest of your day.